In this series of videos, we are going to talk about the large host of microorganisms that travel through life with you and affect your physical and mental well-being. I'm not talking about the microbes that make you sick. They are transient residents on your body that cause trouble and you have a very effective immune system that deals with them. What we'll focus on are the microbes on your body that don't cause disease and in fact are helpful. There are a number of very good videos on this, and I am going to have you watch the TED Talk by Rob Knight on your microbiome. What this video does is dive a little deeper into the specifics of how we investigate the microbiome. Ready? Let's begin. The techniques that are used to investigate the microbiome arose because of a phenomenon that was observed decades ago, the great plate count anomaly. An excellent rigorous example of this was a paper published by John Ishin Jones in the Journal of Limnology and Oceanography. Figure 2 from this paper is shown here. In this experiment, they are trying to count bacteria in seawater and they use a bunch of different methods. On the x-axis is the number of microorganisms per mill, and on the y-axis is the depth in the ocean in meters. If they took a sample and grew them on solid media, on filters or even in liquid media, they would get about zero to 200 colonies per mill of ocean water. However, if they used methods that directly observed the seawater and did not depend upon growth, looking for things that appeared to be bacteria, they saw 100 to 10,000 fold more. This type of experiment has been repeated numerous times over the years using ever more sophisticated methods to determine counts directly and the same result is observed. We are unable to culture over 90% of the microorganisms that we can see in any environment. How could this be? There could be a number of reasons. First, maybe the growth medium does not have the right ingredients to provide all that the bacterium that you're trying to grow needs. Or maybe there are too many nutrients in too high a concentration. Experiments in the last decade have shown this to be true, and one thing we have found often is codependency. Where one bacterium, I will call species one, produces a product or products that another bacterium, species two, depends on. Species one counts on species two to remove its product, and species two depends on species one making that product. When you try to culture either one of the bacteria, you cannot because you purify the other one away in the process. It is difficult to guess what they are making, so creating a medium would be difficult that would replace whatever it is they need. A second issue may be that the right physical conditions for growth of many of these microbes is not being met. First among these is time. Scientists are impatient people. They want their bacteria to grow up in just a few days. Now it's instant understandable because they want to get on with their experiments. Many of these species may be growing slowly, taking days or weeks to increase in number high enough that a human can see them. Also, the temperature may not be right, or it could be too dry. For example, an experiment by Jonathan and Jones, notice how plating on agar, the line A, is always lower than growing in liquid. The line C. Agar has a lower water content, in other words, it's drier than liquid broth, and that can inhibit many organisms. Finally, a last reason, or one of the last reasons I'm gonna mention, there may be inhibitors in the medium. A paper in 2014 by Tanaka et al. from Hakado University in Japan demonstrated that autoclaving phosphates with agar, which is a common practice, can create toxic products that inhibit bacteria. Today, microbiologists are getting better at culturing bacteria but we have a long way to go. If you cannot grow 90% of bacteria in culture, but you still want to identify them, how can you do it? The answer is by using methods that detect macromolecules, things like DNA and protein. Modern methods have gotten so sensitive that they can detect very small quantities in a sample allowing the exploration of any environment by taking manageably small samples. This is the field of molecular microbial ecology, 
and it depends on a number of methods. I'm going to cover three here. Amplicon sequencing, whole genome sequencing, and fluorescence in situ hybridization, which I'll call FISH. In amplicon sequencing, a sample is taken and the DNA is extracted. Then the polymerase chain reaction is run to amplify a section of these organisms. The most common target is the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. This gene is part of the ribosome, something that every living thing has. The ribosome is a very convenient macromolecule to follow because it has regions that are nearly the same in all species and other regions that vary considerably, often being unique to each species. Two pieces of DNA are made that match conserved regions and are universal, meaning they will bind to and hybridize to all known bacterial ribosomal RNA genes. These universal primers bind to opposite ends of the gene and using PCR is possible to amplify up all the various 16S ribosomal RNA genes of the species present in the sample. In the old days, meaning 15 years ago, these amplified DNA fragments were cloned into plasmids and then sequenced. Today, sequencing methods are so sensitive, the cloning step has been eliminated and DNA amplified from samples can be sequenced directly. The sequencing data consists of millions of sequences, each corresponding to a bacterium that was present in the original sample. Each sequence is unique for each species and it's possible to separate and count them, getting a census of all the different bacteria that went in a sample. There are issues with this method, however. Since an amplification step is used, this may introduce bias if the PCR has a bias for or against certain DNA sequences, and it's known that this can happen. Also, there's no reason to assume the universal primer used is actually universal. If it does not recognize a 16S ribosomal RNA gene of a species, it won't be amplified and that species won't be counted. Because of the continuing decrease in the cost of DNA sequencing, Whole genome sequencing has begun to replace amplicon sequencing in molecular surveys of the environment. In this case, microbes from a sample are first collected. DNA is then extracted and broken into uniform sized pieces. While the pieces are uniform in size, where the breaks happen is essentially random. The size of the pieces depends upon the sequencing technology used. Some technologies require short pieces, other technologies can deal with larger ones. Short DNA adapters are added to the ends of the sequence in some sequencing methods, and then all the billions of fragments have their DNA sequence determined. What you end up with is a large collection of sequences. Then, powerful computer software takes these sequences, determines which ones overlap, and assembles them into chromosomes. It's like taking thousands of jigsaw puzzles, mixing all the pieces together, and then trying to assemble the pictures from this mess. It takes fast computers with large amounts of memory, many days to do it, but eventually it will assemble all the DNA into fragments. From here, the small subunit RNA genes can be found for identification. Even better, the entire chromosome of the microbe is available, and since we know the rules for turning DNA into protein, it is possible to determine all the proteins the DNA encodes. If you compare the protein sequences to other known proteins, you can then predict what these proteins do and from that make predictions of the microbe's capabilities. For example, you can determine what type of metabolism the microbe may use. Using amplicon sequencing and whole gene sequencing it is possible to take a census of all the microbes of any environment, including the human body, without having to culture anything. Whole genome sequencing has its own limitations. It can be expensive, but this is decreasing all the time. Second, what you sequence is only as good as the DNA extraction method you use. And this can have a profound impact on the final sequence. If some cells don't break open for you, or you lose the DNA from the sample in other ways, your census will suffer. Finally, assembling chromosomes from DNA fragments is a daunting task, 
and the results often consist of dozens to hundreds of DNA fragments that don't make a chromosome. Often, more experimental work is needed to close the loop in these cases. However, DNA sequencing technology is improving all the time. Taking a census of an environment through sequencing is great, but what if you want to identify a microbe quickly and you want to know specifically where it is in a sample? Since the DNA is extracted out of the environment, DNA sequencing cannot give you any type of spatial information. An excellent tool for asking these type of questions is fluorescence in situ hybridization, known by the acronym FISH. In this technique, a DNA probe is synthesized that matches a unique part of the chromosome of the desired target. The probe can be designed to match only one species of bacteria, or it can be designed to match a universal region that is found in a whole class of bacteria. Probes have even been made that will match almost all bacteria. A fluorescent dye, one that will shine a bright color when excited with ultraviolet light, is then attached to the probe. A sample is then taken from the environment and placed on the slide. The cells are weakened to allow entry of the fish probe and the probe is added. The fish probe will only bind to cells that have the matching DNA sequence. When the slide is observed, everywhere the target microorganism is present, a bright light will be present. How can DNA sequencing in fish probes be used to investigate the human microbiome? We are going to use an example to demonstrate the possibilities. First, let me introduce the problem. Clostridium difficile is a major cause of antibiotic-induced diarrhea in the U.S. In 2011, there were over 493,000 cases and 29,300 deaths. The illness also causes terrible bloating and pain for the afflicted individuals. This is a terrible disease to get. C. difficile is a gram-positive endospore-forming rod. The formation of spores makes it easy to transmit it from patient to patient. The trouble begins after antibiotic treatment that wipes out the normal microbiota of the intestines, allowing colonization by C. difficile. The microbe grows and produces two toxins, TCDA and TCDB. These attack the intestines, causing diarrhea, bloating, and pain. Prevention of this disease relies on barrier methods that prevent the spread of the spores, hand hygiene, careful management of thermometers, and the use of bleach at high enough concentrations to kill the spores. It has also been found that certain antibiotics, penicillin and vancomycin, lower risk, while cephalosporins or clindamycin increase incidence. And this can modulate the risk of developing C. difficile infections. Physicians can decrease the incidence by choosing antibiotics carefully in patients that may be at risk for the disease, and this is mostly the elderly. Conventional treatment was by using other antibiotics to kill the C. difficile infection, such as metroniadazole or vancomycin. Vancomycin has been found to be better for serious disease cases. In disease cases where antibiotic treatment was not working and the patient's life was at risk, cholelectomy, the removal of the colon, may be necessary. A recent development is fecal microbiota transplantation, where the patient is inoculated with a healthy microbiome to replace its diseased one. Fecal transplants are an intriguing idea. But does it work? In the paper by Shanker et al., three patients with CDI were followed, and we're going to look at some of the data from that paper. Fecal samples were taken before the transplant and then various days afterward. DNA was extracted from the samples and it was sequenced. The diagram on the bottom shows the various types of bacteria that were found in the colon of each patient. As you can see, there is a profound shift from a disease state to that of the donor. This change appears to be long-term, with the pattern being stable for more than three months. With fecal transplants, symptoms of the disease have dissipated, and this technique has had a 90% success rate with very little reoccurrence of C. diff infections. Something that does occur 
with antibiotic therapy. Fish probes were also used to look for specific groups of interest in the fecal sample. C. diff patients were found to have an increase in proteobacteria and the researchers wanted to confirm their presence by other methods. A DNA probe was synthesized that would hybridize only to proteobacteria and then mixed with a fecal sample and observed in a fluorescence microscope. As shown in the figure, the proteobacteria became undetectable after the transplant. The microscope provides visual evidence and is a fast and less involved way of finding this group in a sample. This research brings up some exciting possibilities. Patients with irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, or obesity also have altered microbiomes. Could it be possible to treat these illnesses with fecal transplants? Would it be possible to develop a skinny microbiome that an overweight individual can consume and begin to lose weight? If you could do that, it would be a blockbuster product. In summary, we cannot detect all microbes present in the environment by culturing because we cannot grow them all in the laboratory. In a desire to actually learn what is really there, scientists develop methods of detection of microorganisms that do not depend on growing them. In this video, we looked at three methods for detecting these missing microbes, fish, amplicon sequencing, and whole genome sequencing. Fish can tag the microbe of interest, making it visible on a slide. DNA sequencing will tell you what microbes are there and at what population. There are many more methods that we did not cover here that are used, such as proteomics, identifying the proteins in a sample, and metabolomics, detecting the meta metabolites in a sample all at once. Using these methods, scientists have come to a major revelation. Most environments are vastly different than what we observed before when using conventional culturing methods. In fact, most of the microorganisms that we have isolated by culturing are minor players in the environment that they inhabit. The methods used in molecular microbial ecology are in their infancy, and we are sure to learn much more about the human microbiome and all other environments as time goes on.